So I think in theory we've got one minute to go, but no one more is going to get in the room. <laughs> Yeah, look, people can still breathe. Crush in more people. No. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about running OpenStack on OpenStack. And the reason this is an interesting thing to talk about, this is the model that we tell people about OpenStack. You know, it's these lovely big boxes, compute, networking, storage. What we don't tell them is that this is what it looks like to talk about deployments. <laughs> this isn't a lovely, pretty model. <clears throat> And this is the reality. It's not because we've made it much more complex than it needs to be. So we've deployed a public cloud, and other people have deployed public clouds, and none of these people have said, hey, it was so easy, we're going to do that again and again and again and again and just forget about it. Installation is quite straightforward, although if you look inside DevStack, it's not all that straightforward. But running it and upgrading it, they, they really start to get a bit more complex. And so the complexity comes in partly due to that diagram back here, but also because other things can go wrong. You can have bugs in the code. You can have craft or entropy build up on a node, and you can have hardware failures. Now, hardware is kind of the simplest thing to talk about. Make all the things high availability. Well, there's a lot of sessions this week on high availability for different services, and, and this is an important reason why. The craft and entropy thing that turns up, it doesn't turn up when you install your environment, it turns up when you upgrade from Grizzly to Havana, or Havana to some, letter begin, some word beginning with I. And the bugs are really, really interesting to the folk who are trying to deploy from trunk, even snapshots from trunk. The thing about the release is that it's a well-known quantity. Other people have deployed it three weeks before you. You know what their experience was. You can take an educated guess about whether you're ready to, to upgrade or not. But if you're trying to run from trunk, and this session isn't about why you should or shouldn't do that, but if you're trying to, or if you just want to have the ability to do it, you have to expect that you're going to run into bugs daily. New ones, fun ones. So you need to be able to do CI, CD, continuously integrating the code and testing your deployment before you do it or else you'll find out about those bugs when users hit them, not when your test environment does. But how do you make sure you do that with exactly the same tools and processes that you're using to do the deploy? If your test is different than your deploy, the results of your test are no longer reflective of the results of your deploy. So the Triple O project, OpenStack on OpenStack, is about doing continuous integration and delivery of an OpenStack production cloud or a test cloud, but primarily we're aiming at production. We want to drive the maintenance and installation costs down. They're not low enough at the moment. How far down can we drive them? Well, heat plus Nova Bear Metal, we, we think we can drive them very, very low. We're going to encapsulate the installation and upgrade, pro oh, I should, I should say a caveat at the beginning of this. I'm going to talk about some science fiction in this talk. Not, not a lot. Um, we haven't got this thing fully working yet, but we're a long way down the path. With uh, Tim Miller, who's been doing most of the work on the, um, the heat rules for OpenStack for us, was saying earlier it's about 99% there. So once we're at the point where we've got something working and scaling, then we can look at actually making it better and better. And from an operations point of view, one of the key things is that we want the same API for deploying, scaling, and managing the cloud that we use to deploy, scale, and manage applications in the cloud, because then the skill sets and the knowledge that you have are reusable. And the monitoring things that you put in place to monitor that API apply at both levels. So this is the story that we've got. Now, it starts with the developer making a change, because we're looking at continuous deployment, deploying off of trunk. From the change, it goes into the Zool, Jarrett sort of system we've got here in, in the public OpenStack, but you could also run a private instance of all the code, because it's all public, uh, it's all open. And you'll build an image that contains the changed code. If you made a change in Oslo, that change might be five or 10 images. But if you made a change just in, um, say, the Quantum API server, you probably only need one new image, which would be a new Quantum API image. You deploy that to bare metal and you test it. 
you make sure it works and runs its unit tests and that kind of minimum degree of capability. But you then deploy it into a production bootstrapped cloud. So you start a cloud on one machine, you scale it out with this new image and with the old images. So you're testing cross-version compatibility, which is one of the weak points we currently have in our CI CD story for, for all of OpenStack. But when you're deploying to an existing cloud, you don't magically flip all your nodes from Grizzly to Havana. You know, it's, it's not like we're done. It's actually, even with the best deployment technologies around, it's going to be a 10 to 15 minute exercise to do that for a large cloud. So you're going to expect API requests coming in on one version and being satisfied by um, backends running either the older version or the newer version. You've got lots of scheduling issues to worry about there. We want to make sure it works. So we put load on a cloud and we do that upgrade. Assuming everything comes out okay, we then take the result as a permission to go and deploy. And here's the key thing. What we deploy is then the same images we use to test. We don't do a separate build process. We don't install software into existing environments. We take those images and we deploy them. And so this is, this is the overview. I'll go into all the details further on. The problem space that we think we're dealing with is one which has these separate columns, which is provisioning of machines, software installation of machines, configuration of the machine, managing state, managing different database um, schema versions, database migrations, um, swift ring transitions. These are big state changes that can take a significant period of time to complete. Um, all these slides are going to be published, so if you guys are taking photos to make sure you have the slides for later, you can get a much better version from uh, my Twitter stream later. And finally, you've got orchestration, which is about making sure the right machines are only the right endpoints and that all the machines know about each other and are connected and glued up properly. We've got a list here of some of the different products in the space and our perception of them. So Razor does provisioning and a little bit of software. Puppet does software configuration and state management, but not really that much orchestration. And I'm, I can guarantee that everyone who's got a vested interest in any of these products will have a problem with this slide. So I'm just going to say this is our, our view on it. And the blue boxes up the top are the components in the OpenStack that are responsible for these things. Disk Image Builder, OpenStack Config Applier, and OpenStack Config Refresh are three things that we've been building specifically for this. They're on StackForge now. Um, we're looking at what to do with Disk Image Builder. We might prom um, propose it to be promoted to a, a full-blown project, or we might roll it into the sort of glance umbrella because it, de it deals with disk images. OSConfig Applier and Config Refresh are very, very small tactical things just so you don't need a full-blown puppet or a full-blown chef to do what we're talking about. You can replace them by using chef or puppet if you, if you feel that's in a, the, the right way forward, or, or juju. So um, Nova Bare Metal is a key component for this because we need to be able to deploy things to actual machines, and Nova Bare Metal can deploy a disk image to physical hardware. Um, heat is, as I said, orchestration. Uh, Clint has a talk. Um, I think on Wednesday or Thursday about running OpenStack with Heat, which goes into the details of our templates and, and how they all tie together. <coughs> Disk Image Builder is a tool that just knows how to take an existing cloud image, like an Ubuntu published cloud image or a Red Hat published cloud image, and transform it to install software on it and prepare it for run as an element in a, in a Heat deployed environment. So you can use Disk Image Builder to put something like Hadoop on the cloud we're using it to put the OpenStack components on, on an image. And we, we build two big sorts of images. We build one image for bootstrapping with everything clombed into one big machine. And we also build images that are very targeted. This is a, a Nova bare metal compute image. This is a glance image. And that's how you get horizontal scaling without any craft, because you've got a clean image on every single time. Um, who here is not familiar with Nova bare metal? Right, OK, so Nova Bare Metal operates like a Nova Compute process. It sits up, as far as Nova's concerned, it is a Nova Compute process, and it has got resources it can manage. But it doesn't put itself in the Compute Nodes table. What it puts in the Compute Nodes table are synthetic records that refer to actual physical machines that it can deploy to. 
And whenever it deploys an instance, it takes an entire machine. It never takes a partial machine. And the way it does the deploy is it uses PXE and IPMI, IPMI or any other power manager, to, to reboot the physical hardware. And then the PXE boot process to copy a RAM disk of our own on, and then that RAM disk exports iSCSI and we copy stuff on. For all the gory details, see Devin <coughs> Anders talk. But the key thing is, it's an over API, and it's bare metal, and it's a machine image. It's not an installer, so you're not running an installation process. You're taking an actual ready-to-go image and dropping it on. Um, heat, I mean, it's got auto scaling and a bunch of other things, but the, the key thing for us is it's the glue. It's the thing that's able to say, I know that I need a RabbitMQ server and a MySQL server and a um, Nova API server, and I need passwords from this one to be handed into this one, and this one here needs to pass um, connection details back here, and, and can just handle that flow of information, configuration metadata between machines. And it doesn't do anything within a machine. I mean, there are tools that are specific to it that can do stuff within a machine. But essentially, all it does is provides metadata and delivers the metadata to the machine, and then you take that over and you run with whatever you want to run with. Now, as I said, we can use Chef or Puppet, but we've written a very, very small tool chain that will um, just enough to do, to do what we're doing. So we've got templates for this. They're, they're not in Stack Forge yet. They're in this OpenStack Ops project, which is going to have uh, ref stack and, and a few other things turning up there. And those templates um, describe the metadata that Heat know, it needs to know to be able to describe an entire OpenStack configuration. Um, it's not finished, it's work in progress. Now, the really nice thing is that when something changes in the environment, you need to take actions on your other nodes. Like, if you turn on a new Nova API front end somewhere, it's going to need credentials to talk to Rabbit. And you probably don't want all of your machines using the same credentials to talk to your queue, because if one machine gets compromised, everyone is compromised at that point. So when you turn on that machine, you want to ask the RabbitMQ machine to create a new user, set it up, and give the credentials back. And the heat triggers are just a perfect way to do that. So the, you export the presence of the machine into heat. The RabbitMQ machine is listening for an event. It says, oh, there's a new machine that uses me. I'll create users for it. And it exports that back in, targeted back to the, the machine that just got added. So you have this information flow back and forth. Within the images that we build, when something changes, we've got several different sorts of changes that can occur. It might be something very trivial in which case we want to just restart the services that were affected. It might be something more substantial. It might be something where we need to shut stuff down before we make the change take place. Um, a new um, KVM library version or something. Or it may be really substantial where we have to reboot the machine because there's a new kernel. So we've got a very, very simple model on this. We say um, we're going to do something, shut down anything that's fragile, take the new metadata, write configuration files from it, start up services again, and then run migrations. And the restart point is where we'll just do a check and say, hey, there's a new kernel, we should reboot the machine. And when the deploy is finished, we notify Heat that this has been done. So at that point, Heat can say, hey, that machine's completed, I can move on to the next machine. How many machines you do at once is going to depend on the size of your cloud. If you've got 10 compute nodes, you probably want to do one at a time, right? If you've got 10,000, you might want to do more than one machine at a time. Um, we're using golden images for this. Now, golden images can mean a lot of different things to different people. So let me define really precisely what I mean. We have a disk image that represents a running version of software. It has no configuration on it, or no, none of the configuration that settings that we'd ever change. And it doesn't have um, seed databases for MySQL or anything. It's just, just the software. When we deploy it, we create a separate partition that we're going to store the state in. Then when we redeploy it and we rebuild that node, we keep these other partitions intact. Now, that's, this is one of the bits of science fiction. We can't do that yet until we've got the bare metal cinder API stuff in place. But it was very clear to us how it will work when that's done. Conceptually, the golden images act as packages. They are, a pa they are a thing that describes an intact set of software that works, but they describe it at the machine level. 
rather than at the individual bit of software level. And this is important because when you deploy, you don't want to find out about conflicts and um, dependency issues on the machine you just deployed to. So you, your unit of deployment needs to be the unit of thing that you test with. And so because to turn on a data center in the first place, you have to deploy the machines, our unit of deployment is clearly a machine. And this image builder I mentioned before is a very, very small tool chain, just a few shell scripts, but very, very useful. Um, we've split out the core, which knows how to do Ubuntu, Fedora, um, i386, uh, AMD64 images, and the um, stuff that's specific to running OpenStack on OpenStack. So the disk image builder should be useful for people who are deploying Hadoop or other large cluster software into an OpenStack environment, even if they don't use um, heat and they don't use the rest of the tool chain. It's a um, focused, focused tool. <coughs> Sorry. So the way deployments work is that he the heat stack is defining the cluster. Heat is driving the Nova API to deliver images to machines, and its triggers are updating the environment on the machine. Um, one thing I skipped over before is that once we have a machine running, if we've got a new image to deploy, we can do that without rebooting the machine if the software in that machine decides to cooperate. So it can observe the heat metadata and see there's a new image ID. It can pull the image out a glance and R sync it across the existing root file system. Because none of our state, none of our precious data is on the root file system, we can use delete after. We delete any craft that was there, old package versions, gone, temporary user codes for debugging, gone, and we end up with something that is exactly equivalent to having started with an image fresh out of glance. In developer test environments, use virtual machines. In production, use real hardware. Now, these things combine to give us what we call the undercloud and the overcloud. Now, conceptually, you might say, let's have one big cloud. It's got bare metal, and some of the bare metal nodes are running KVM or Zen compute nodes, and then within those nodes will run other things, and those services will also be part of the cloud. Now, there's, there's several pragmatic problems with that in the short term. Long term, I'd like to get to that as a, as a capability. In the short term, Nova doesn't particularly like having really different hypervisors running in the same environment. I don't know the exact details. Maybe it's false. Maybe it actually works just fine, in which case I'll redo the slide tomorrow. Um, but another pragmatic problem is that when you have something virtualized and you turn off the data center, say there's an earthquake and, or in a, you know, a bomb threat, you suddenly have to evacuate, or even a, a catastrophic power failure that turns off your data center, you don't have a choice about it. How do you restart services if everything's virtualized? Or if, say, all your Glance API endpoints are virtualized? To bring them up, you have to turn on the machines they're running on, and those machines are running with Nova Bare Metal, so they also need to be bootable. But the metadata that that machine will need to know, to know which VMs to restart and which VMs had actually been migrated off or were stale for some reason, is inaccessible. The rest of the network's not running yet. So by having a very clear separation of this is the bare minimum facilities to run a cloud, and it's the bare metal cloud, it's just doing bare metal machines, some of those machines will, will host actual services, but nothing is virtualized. You can be sure <coughs> that your power on story is fairly simple. Once we get in place the ability to recover without the rest of the network, turn on a KVM or a um, <coughs> Zen hypervisor and have all the VMs that were running on it before come back with their networking configuration and everything else intact, then you can start saying, well, let's mix and match much more freely. <coughs> But the, the other thing that's nice about having an undercloud and overcloud is that your overcloud tenants are not special. They may be privileged because you trust them to run on bare metal hardware, but they're not in any way unique. So you can run several different clouds on top of one undercloud. You can run a test cloud, you can run your production KVM cloud, um, you can run dev test cycles for people doing perform high performance work, and it, it's... it's um, it's an API. APIs are great. <coughs> so in the undercloud, we want a fully high available bare metal open stack. <coughs> now, we don't need Swift. We just need Glance, Nova, Keystone, Heat. So it's a very small subset of, of everything that we need. But it's got to be fully available 
because how are we going to deploy upgrades to that cloud? We're going to use the API that the cloud hosts to turn off nodes within it and turn them back on again with new versions of a disk image in the case of a, of a kernel change rather than the special case I mentioned before. We think we can do this quite reliably with just two machines, both of them running a full stack, Rabbit, MySQL, Nova API, Nova Bare Metal Compute, just full HA up and down. Now, that's not how you want to scale out when you're hitting thousands and thousands of machines, but it means that the overheads are low enough that someone who's running a 10-node compute cluster could conceivably put two small machines aside and, and do this without it killing them. You could do one, but I don't know how you would upgrade that ever using this methodology, because it would be trying to reboot itself, and it would just, my brain hurts. And the overcloud can be, because it's running on bare metal, you can run your actual hypervisor. So it can be a full KVM or, or Zen-based um, overcloud. Here's an important thing. The heat that orchestrates the overcloud is running in the undercloud. So you need to be able to talk cross-cloud. And if you, we can expect that there'll be some bugs that we'll run into where folk assume that the um, local cloud configuration I've got is authoritative for all of the endpoints they talk to in actual fact this will be one of the cases where it's not. And because KVM and Zen um, Nova can boot just disk Im uh, partition images rather than full disk images, you can use the same disk images for your overcloud and undercloud. Um, installation. Installation is where it's fun. So this is a special case of normal deployment, and this is where I think the value proposition starts to become really clear. We start with one of these all-in-one disk images I mentioned before, they have got the whole stack. But we start with it in degraded mode, so there's no high availability. And we can build one of these images straight out of disk image builder. We don't need an existing open stack to get this going. We run, run the, I'm sorry, um, sore throat. So you, you run that in a virtual machine on your laptop and you bridge it to the network in your data center. Enroll all the machines, so you teach it about the MAC address and the physical characteristics of all the machines in the data center. And then you just tell Heat, please scale this out. Change me from being a one node, everything in one place, to a two node, everything in one place. And it will take one of the machines out there, and it will bring it up, it will run the data migration scripts to copy over the MySQL databases to set up Rabbit and HA mode and so on. And then you just turn off that VM that you had. Everything is now running in HA mode, degraded, on one of the machines in the data center. Do that again. Heat will ask Nova for another bare metal node that will boot up. And it will drop a disk image on that that has the same thing. It has the whole vertical stack, and it will reassociate everything back into HA. And you're now fully operational. You've got a full bare metal cloud that can deploy to any of the other machines. You've got Glance. Keystone. And that, I think, is probably the simplest installation story I've heard. And this is why I'm talking about because I love it. Um, the HA, no, the, so the, the HA scale out stuff for MySQL is done. The HA order configuration for Rabbit's not done yet. Um, the heat roll, heat doesn't yet really know about rolling deploys, so it will, if you were to try and upgrade that, it would turn them both off at the same time. That won't work very well. And Nova, um, there's a bunch of little niggly HA things in Quantum and in Nova Bare Metal uh, that will give you, you know, you'd have to have manual fix-up scripts at the moment rather than having it just work. We, not, this is not a forward-looking statement, but uh, getting all of the stuff, all, all, all the polish needed to make it just work reliably is the Havana cycle focus for us. So the, the Grizzly cycle we spent most of the time bringing the bits together, um, figuring out exactly how things were going to interact and fixing bare metal to, to be more production ready and so on. So the cycle is, is largely polish. So that is actually the last slide. I don't know if I talked too fast or whether we're just on time, but questions?
Okay, so the question is, if you've got a, a Nova Compute VM host and you do a deploy to it, how do you make sure you don't lose state about the VMs that are running, uh, and in particular, rollbacks? So I don't think rollbacks are any different to roll forwards, really, in, in the sense that if we have to restart the orchestration process, it will lose whatever state it has that's not being persisted on disk at the time. And there's a session on that. So I mean, to, to, to frame things, we're interested in making this work by improving the various bits of OpenStack that need to improve. So I would delegate that answer back to Nova and say, we need to make sure that Nova can be shut down on a KVM node, leaving the KVM processes running, started back up again, and any things that the Nova process itself would have had to do to orchestrate uh, live migrations, for instance, should be the next step of that should be picked up. And as long as you have the software ready to go, so you shut it down and you start it, it shouldn't be visible. And that seems like a Nova problem to solve that lots of people are interested in solving. Um, I don't think Triple O as a, as a program needs to do anything specific there. Um, the tricky thing with KVM instance hosts is the kernel. If you want to change the kernel out without rebooting, that gets a little bit more tricky. So what, what do you have working right now and where's your code? So the code is uh, wrong button. I have a slide with uh, the main, I may not have a slide with the main link. Oh, that's wonderful, Robert. Okay, so um, github.com slash triple O slash incubator is the entry point into the, the project. And that's where we put stuff we don't know where it really belongs yet. And it's got a readme there that describes everything and has links out to all the other code. Now, I, I have the other links in here. Um, Disk image builder, config applier, and refresh config, which are the two things that take the heat triggers and, and react appropriately, are in Stackforge. So if you just look in Stackforge, they're right there. And they're on you know, normal review process and so on. Um, the incubator itself has basically documentation and a couple of convenient scripts, like take a disk image and boot it on my local machine without OpenStack because I want to try booting something that is OpenStack. Um, and there are things that will probably die off eventually, or we'll move them in as helpers in the Nova libraries or, or, or whatever. And everything else we've been doing has been done directly in projects like Nova. So Devon And is working on Nova Bare Metal nearly full time because that needs to be really robust and solid for this whole thing to work. Is that, is that sufficient? Um, so, and what do you have working right now? Oh, what do we have working right now? So disk image build is basically done. We're very happy with all the, um, the, the way we build disk images. OS config applier, which is just the, this template thing, it's done. Refresh config is done as well. I mean, the, the enablers. The templates to do OpenStack are broken into two parts. There's a set of templates that are the config applier templates. They're just moustache templates, and they describe the et cetera files you're going to have on disk. They are basically done for the bootstrap, everything in one node, but they're not done for the, and I want to separate things out into this targeted node and that targeted node. Um, that will be fairly straightforward to do once we get to the point where that's a, the next thing to do. The uh, description of an OpenStack cloud and heat metadata, I think that's pretty much complete. Uh, probably doesn't have Swift yet. And it certainly doesn't have um, non-core things like Bock or other components that people like to drop in. But it also is it's a very simple environment to work in, so it should be straightforward to do that if you're interested. The, um, the thing where I talked about where on the disk we separate out the metadata, the, the, the persistent state, and, and your config files that you are changing from the disk image itself is not done because we don't have Cinder Bear Metal in place yet. Now, there's going to be an unconference session, session with John Griffith and myself and whoever else is interested in making, um, deciding the approach for that. Quantum, so one of the things we had to do in the last cycle was to fix quantum so that you could say, hey, this machine we're booting, it's going to actually have this MAC address because it's hardware. That's the address on the card. Sorry, you need to deal with that. Uh, that sort of stuff is largely done. 
At the moment, though, you can't do PXE booting with Quantum. So donkey has been working hard on getting a generic framework into Quantum where you can do, here's some DHCP options to give this particular port inside Quantum. Um, once that lands, there's a very small patch we need to do to pass the Nova Compute host that's going to be doing the image transferal and thus needs to be listed as a PXE host for the node to Quantum as part of the um, config for the network. So that, that'll be a very small patch. Um, I think that's pretty much the whole state of play. So within a few weeks, I've been able to say, hey, look, it's all working and it's polish. But it's, it was, it's so close. Um, so there's a kind of squidge. So, so one of the interesting things that, that is kind of a refinement of this is like um, scheduling locality, right? I, I want to make sure I've got a high available database and I want both sides of it to be in different racks, different power zones, which is not quite what you're asking, but it kind of relates to it. Okay. So in terms of having pools of hardware and so on, I think we need to solve, uh, OpenStack needs to solve um, rack awareness in the general sense for scheduling. And once you've got that, then I think the ability to say, hey, I'm doing database deploys virtualized or database deploys physical and make sure that they get the right hardware available is, is a subset of that problem. Um, is that, did I understand? Right, oh, so who's, who schedules onto which, which thing? So when there are two clouds, you just point your thing at the cloud you want to deploy into. That's the endpoint you use. So it's very straightforward. Um, if you're trying to do things that burst across two clouds, then heat doesn't do bursting yet, but I believe there's a session this week on making it do that. <laughs> and for that point, you'll just have two definitions. They'll say you can burst from here to here. Maybe you say start with virtual, and if you run out of virtual, go to physical, or the other way around. Um, more interesting to me is making sure that you land on a machine that's really targeted to databases. Like the best con hardware config for a high performance database config looks very different to the best config for a virtual machine host. Um, so I, I see lots of scheduler work in, in our future to make that. I mean, there are hints and there's policies I haven't dug into, and it may be just a matter of configuration file writing, but someone's going to have to take the time to really make that very straightforward for people to do. Uh, how fast can you bring up a, a 50,000 node environment? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> now, I, I, don't, I don't know the actual answer to this because we're not in production with this. Um, if, we, if we have to do image deploys... So the process for bringing back up, so if we fix all the bugs that are related to this, I would expect something like turn on 10% of the machines, wait for their power utilization to stabilize, just look at a, at, a, at a load meter in your data center power bar, and then turn on another 10%, then turn on another 10%, then turn on another 10%, and so on until you're done. And you shouldn't have to care about which machines come on in which order, other than your network switches. And even then, you shouldn't really have to care because all of our software should be able to deal with the fact that in a cloud, hardware fails, a switch will die, you don't want to have to reboot all of the machines, the hosting uh, VMs that are attached to that switch to replace the switch. So we should be able to deal with any component going away and coming back in a, in a reasonable time frame, gracefully. So if you have that, I think it should be something like three or 10 times the power cycle time plus the boot time for your OS. And that should be a constant. Shouldn't matter how big your data center is, it should be just flick on 10%, wait three minutes, flick on 10%, wait three minutes, and then you need to wait a couple of minutes for things to retry and reconnect and go, oh, Rabbit's actually there and it's usable and you should be done. That said, I, I don't think OpenStack's really ready for that. There's a lot of code that 
I'm sure hasn't been written yet, needed to enable that. Right now I suspect it looks something like, turn on your control plane, your two machines or your 50 machines. Um, so you said 50,000 node, I'd expect you'd maybe need 50 machines to manage that. Um, because you want to be able to do deploys very, very quickly. So you're just having capacity there to spread the load out, spread the network traffic out. Um, one of the future things we'd like to do is to use BitTorrent to do the d images when we're doing a live push. So all the machines can just get local traffic and it can flood. Um, Twitter has done a paper about a thing they called Murder. We, we haven't got on to doing that yet, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to talk as much as possible about what we have going today. Um, so I think turn on the control plane, and you'd probably turn that on database first, then Rabbit, then you'd turn on the Keystone, Keystone API, your HA proxies for that, then you'd turn on dependent services that depend on Keystone, such as the Nova API, Nova backends, Glance, and then once those are all turned on, you'd then start powering on, at 10% of the time, your compute fleet. And your compute fleet will be coming up, and it's got the key services it depends on, and away you go. Um, but because there are two clouds, there's actually two times that first stage. So that could be quite an extensive process. I don't think it should be, but I expect it would be today, with any deployment technology, in fact, because it's an application problem. The ability to respond properly when things weren't there when you got turned on is a Nova limitation, not a puppet or chef or, or anything else. Sorry, I, I don't quite follow the, the question. Um, any, so the, the Nova bare metal driver can deploy anything that can be written to a petition in a, a normal petition. And it's got no constraints on the host, or on the operating system that's deployed. So if you have an image of Windows or an image of Zen or an image that's just regular Linux, any of those images can be deployed by Nova bare metal onto a machine. So there shouldn't be any limitations on what you can do. I think, does, does that? Yeah. Okay. Do you have any hardware recommendations for these configurations? I mean, like, what, what works really well? Like, should I have a separate drive, an SSD, um, So for the triple O stuff itself, we are, I, I would throw, 16 gig of RAM and a big enough disk to run, you know, six months history of glance images. Because you can keep the old images and you can roll back and you can say, hey, throw me up a test cluster with this. I want to see what was going on six months ago. I think something bad was happening. And you get some really nice history out of that. The reason I suggest 16 gig of memory is because if you imagine that you've got uh, Rabbit, MySQL, Nova API, Nova Compute, bare metal compute, Keystone, Keystone API, you, you quickly get to you know, double digit numbers of discrete images. And when you do a deploy, all of those images have to be read into RAM before they can be copied out through iSCSI. So um, the image size that of the petition you write on the, the far end isn't necessarily connected to the image size that you have with a QCAL2 or, or whatever image, but you're going to take a RAM hit on the bare metal compute node when you do this. Even, we've got some optimizations in place now and there are more we need to do. Um, we're waiting on this quantum PXE thing, as I mentioned before, before we can do them all. Um, but when they're done, you store them on enough RAM that that fits in your working set so that you're never waiting for a disk during a deploy. Um, it will have almost no compute work to do at all. You could throw an Atom processor in there and I think it will work just fine. Um, and the reason, and, and as much disk as you want glance history, but again, because you don't want to be hitting disk at all, you shouldn't need to worry about disk performance, it should just be capacity. Right, so that was the thing I've touched on before, which is the power on after a, a failure of the entire data center story. Um, pick, pick a service that we might want to virtualize, something like, I don't know, Nova Ray, hmm? Horizon, okay. So Horizon is something that's got no dependencies and sure, virtualize it, great. Pick any other service, I think you'll find things that depend on it. 
the conductor service for Nova, for example, if that's not there, you can't bring up other Nova nodes. If it's running on top of a Nova node, that Nova node can't be brought up to bring up the conductor service that the Nova nodes need to run on. And the same goes for a database and for anything else in the under, under cloud. I think this is solvable, but it's a bunch of engineering work to allow all of the services to come up without their dependencies and resume operating the way they were when they were shut down. No. Uh, so with bare metal, we can write a boot block to each disk. So if the bare metal provisioner is not there, the machine just boots up with the boot block. And the heat metadata that was in place at the time of the power failure is still in place on disk. It's been written to a persistent file. It's not in the RAM disk. It stays there across reboots. It might be stale, but once everyone's connected, it can get updated. The the only tricky bit is the IP address for the machine needs to be preserved, and actually DH client writes that and will try and use the previous IP address. Now, I'm not certain that we've got the configuration absolutely right to reuse the IP address when DHCP isn't available, but that is an existing feature of DH client that we can use. Yeah. So one of the big things is being able to recover from disasters. And um, I'd like to get to the point where everything is, is virtualized, turtles all the way down, because that will give you greater hardware density. But, and here's the thing, another approach to that is to just run multiple services that can coexist within one image, coexisted, and not virtualized at all. Now, that's obviously not a general solution for any arbitrary bit of code, but for just running OpenStack enough to get OpenStack up, it works fine, which is why we've taken that approach. It's simple and it, it Like I say, I'll be ha so um, policy versus mechanism. Policy-wise, for the deployments I'm putting together, I need to be able to do power on reliably, and the things I mentioned before are reasons why that won't work. Will the triple O heat stacks that that are being built be ones that would support that if you wanted to roll it out that way? Yeah, absolutely. I don't see any reason why people shouldn't be able to do that if they want to. If they're confident in their power on, uh, they'll never need to do a, a cold power on. That's their choice. Using, using what? Mesos. Mesos, okay, yep. What is, what is HP's position or, you know, they try to believe in fine grain scheduling or more like container model like that? Um, I don't know. I've, the, HP's a, a big company and we've got lots and lots of um, things happening. I've been focused very much on the, this deployment story and for this deployment story, we, we don't have enough, we don't have it all working yet, so we haven't really been in a position to branch out into more esoteric questions. And do you support Dynamish linking and um, files libraries on the next? Yeah, I mean, it, it, so I mean, the, these nodes are just running straight, you know, Red Hat or Ubuntu, whatever your preference is. Uh, we're Ubuntu folks, so we're developing on Ubuntu, but um, with, with, the software you install in it. We don't place any restrictions on how it works or what you can do with it. Uh, check my Twitter, RBT Collins on Twitter, and I'll put them up after the talk. RB, RBT Collins. Um, yeah, it does, in fact. So yeah, rbtcollins at hp.com is my email, and the first part is my Twitter handle. So I'll put the slides up there, and you know, as soon as I get online. Uh, so probably we should have everything. I, if we don't have everything working in Havana, then then there's going to be a problem for me anyway. <laughs> the 
amount of work we've got needed to get to a minimal functional set is fairly small. So I'm, I'm confident that Havana will see this being usable. So I think folk from the next session are starting to percolate in. Um, you can grab me outside if you've got further questions. <laughs>